specifically the board. This can help us by providing cool effects of sports arenas, you know, like a basketball arena. You'll see the big loop around the inside of the arena, uh, right at the bottom of the bleachers that displays score or it has a light going around the round. And then it'll also be on emergency view. Now, I'll, I'll just like to mention this. We also learned the incorrect way of how to use an Arduino nano board. We always had situations where we got a little too hot or we needed to fix some of the wiring. That, that was very that was very helpful to know. And as you can see on the screen, we have the left wires right here and the right wires on the other side. And we use these wires to help program the codes to work as well. And this is very, this is very simple wiring. I just just a certain, certain number of jumpers. And this picture only shows uh, the basic model, you could say. What we actually did is we created to where all the lights worked. And it ended up looking really cool. And this black wire right here, that's the ground. That's making sure that the power has somewhere to go. It doesn't shock anything. And these red wires right here go directly into the positive side of the LED lights. And that creates, uh, uh, that creates the energy transmission and allows the lights to illuminate. Now the code right here, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it too well on the back, but right here we have two backslashes and then everything from the backslash over, it's known as pseudocode. Now pseudocode, simple definition of it is, it's just the stuff for the user to understand. It's, it's just normal words, it's not actual code. You can say it's just so, it puts it into a simpler language. And right here, you have the timer, and you're setting up everything at the very top. And then uh, right here, you've got the loop. That's determining how long the program will run, for how many times, for, how, for a certain amount of time. And right here, you have the digital right. It's telling the actual board what to do. High, it's telling it to turn the light on. Low, turn the light off. And then it's the same thing for all the lights, and it just continues to repeat over and over again. So this is a video of our project working. Now as you can see the lights, uh, they alternate, they turn on, they go down, and as uh, just uh, not even a half a second after they turn on, they turn off and it just continues and continues. Pictures of a really um, good um, activity, and as you can see, this blue wire right here is connected to the computer, and we needed to connect it so that when we were inputting the code into the computer, it would actually um, be outputted into here, and it would work. That's something we also learned, and we didn't necessarily dive deep into. But right here, we have a small uh, plastic piece. You can actually hook a manifold battery up to it, and then it'll operate without a computer. You just simply load the code onto the brain, you can call it, and then you can use the, the watch battery. I've seen the small watch batteries that someone's born uh, right on there. And we can use a 9 volt battery for a lot more power and longer run time. Okay, so the, Right, and the wires, I refer to them as jumpers. Not, not everyone does, but I do. And it's, it's a very simple, uh, it's a very simple wire. Most are about this long right here. And then they have a, on the ends, they're stripped, or it, it's just a single piece of wire. You, most of you have seen it's a simple piece of wire. And then it has a coating around the edge, around the outside. And then on the ends, it's been stripped to where it'll hook into the connections on the board, and it'll actually transfer the power. And this is where we're, we were finalizing the presentation. So on day one, we learned the basics of how to use the Arduino software and hardware. We also learned how to, we also figured out how to program LEDs so that they would turn on and off when you scroll the camera. 
and we did have a lot of fun. Uh, we would rate this class 10 out of 10. It was extremely fun, extremely informative. We had a lot to take away from this, and we know how to use it now in our everyday life. Any questions, comments, or concerns? That's fine. You see, you see right there. Everybody on Facebook can see this. Yes. Sergeant Harper. Sergeant Harper. You know that's what I do. Sure. So, you see that? Make sure they can see you, okay? Uh -huh. All right, group two, you ready? Oh. Get it. All right. I'm Cadet Nordic. I'm Cadet Watson. I'm Cadet Gantz, and I'm Cadet Lab. And we did our presentation on projecting a text onto an LCD display. LCD stands for liquid crystal display. This is for the Earth. So, okay, so this is all like the list of the activities that we did. We did mission three, was, which was basically we had to project a text on the LCD display. We had to connect the wires to a ground board in order for the text display on the screen. Um, mission six was basically, again, we had to connect the wires to the ground board in order for like a buzzer sensor to like come on. And then the keypad mission was basically when we had a numerical pad and we had to make sure that all the numbers on the numerical pad matched the numbers on the computer. And then for the moisture soil mission, we had to collect soil in order Ooh, we had to collect, ooh, collect soil, put it in a cup, and we had to put wires in the cup, connect it to the um, board, and we just basically had to see how much moisture was in the soil. And for time purposes, you're only going to be focusing on mission three. Excuse me, can you speak up, please? Me? 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 All right, so the main goal of the project was to create a text on the LCD display. Um, we are projecting it. So the process of it was, for one, you first had to connect the wires to the board, which if you messed up, you would either have to start over. But good thing we color coded it, so if you messed up on the wires, we were able to find which wire was in the wrong location and fix it. We also had to put the fix the coding on the computer. It does not matter if your wires are correct. If your codes are incorrect, it's not gonna work properly because they kind of, they basically work together. And we were basically trying to figure out what the LCD backlight was controlled by. So the purpose of this was to figure out how to display text like our names, we did that, or how to display a text that we wanted or a certain phrase that we wanted to say on the LCD display. And and also how to wire it correctly um, and code it correctly on the computer and on the board. Uh, where and who? So you could probably find this in stadiums, uh, video games possibly, uh, calculators is a good example, um, school billboards, subway trains, and possibly radios, um, and big companies like like I said, train stations and school, schools might do and else do And here we have the wiring, as you can see here. We have all we have power to the ground for being connected. We also have play, because as we just said, we have power to the test of our gun. We have all the other wires. Basically, just a lot of, long story short, 
they're just the power of the system. They just have the wires have to be in order to code to work properly. So this is the code. The the first section is telling you what the little liquid crystal display is, and then this section is where we would put in the code for what we wanted it to say. In, um, in short, we displayed it as alpha 6, we are. and we would put it in quotations so that it would show up on the board correctly in letters and sentences. So basically, this is just going to be a video of us displaying Alpha 6 on the text display. Who, where, would we use 
Now, Morse code has been a very militarized, uh, uncommon way of speaking to people. It is a very long and lengthy process to send out a simple sentence. And we would use this in order to give messages that other people can understand. If you can understand Morse code, you can send messages through dots or beeps or lights like we use. So I was learning a little Morse code in in the class. So if Sergeant Major Brown is in here, he needs to learn Morse code. The same. Yeah, you know, he'd be screaming us out. Oh, uh, here's just a little picture of our wiring. It's not too it wasn't too um complicated setup, but uh, this is where the sound comes from. And um, this is where the code is sent to. It leaves um, the dots and the lengthy lines that come through. And uh, that's the code. Yeah, here's some code. If you have like a pin or something, you know, you can just tap it. Um, you know, you can say if you want to try to spell your name, it's A, B, you know. One dot represents a single uh, beep. One long dash represents a pause. And combination of these and spell numbers and letters to form sentences and phrases. Here's a short video. Um, in this video, it'll um, force code in my name, my last name, my last name. It takes Yeah, it's two days. It's like 30 seconds. He's got two. Now, as you can see, this all of the noise and every line that you can tell is a breach, which tells you on the project about Morse code. And you can decipher whatever the what word or sentence is, just the combination of noises and few words.
Uh, it's like a memory game. So, uh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I forgot. I um, can't help myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, my name is Cadet Everson, and uh, I'm Cadet Brown. I'm Cadet Barber. I'm Cadet Bird. Like I said, it was a memory game, right? So uh, we used lights and sounds. We had to program them to work and make music. So it was a lot of coding. Our code was very long because every time the game reset and played a new game, it was a different sequence. So there was different codes for all of it. And uh, this game tests the ability of the players. Uh, mind capability to remember everything and then also put them against each other because of the high score. Everybody wanted to beat the high score. So throughout our class we had every other group trying to beat each other's score. And we beat Bravo's high score also. So just saying. Yeah. Not only that, I think we beat about like 8 as well. It was uh, Kat Sanders. I don't know where she is. She beat it like 8. It was like 21 or something. <laughs> All right. Um, the purpose of our project, um, because of how complicated it is, you can see all the wiring and stuff. And this doesn't even show the code, which is like I think the longest one. Um, it really taught us a lot about software and hardware because of the intricacy of both of them. And uh, also taught us how well it worked together. You just probably can't see it, but here it shows the high score um, and then your score next to it. And it would work mobily if the battery worked, but the jack was fried. So, um, but other, other than that, it all works. So. Also, we had to learn how to use the LCD. So uh, we had to learn how to use that before we started our own project. So we kind of had to take a little extra step. The buttons used in this device were almost everywhere worldwide. Everything from video game controllers and uh, to industrial controller panels and everything in between. Not even, er, not to, not even to mention LEDs which have made life, made life enormously cheaper and more so you see LEDs in almost anything from Christmas, Christmas lights to like really anything. Most lights we use in houses now are LED. So it's pretty cool that we got to work with them on this little Arduino panel and we learned how they actually wired up. And here's some of the close up shots. This is with an LCD or LCD and then that's from our brother. So whenever they light up, they have a sound with each light. So it's not only color coded, it's also sound coded. And here's just a small portion of our code. Like I said, it was really long. We couldn't fit it all. So uh, would you like to explain it? Uh, yeah, I, I can explain it a little bit. Um, so basically, the, you really can't show it. It's like three pages. but. Uh, this is the setting to high score, so it says high score is zero, and each time a player uh, gets another point, it adds up the high score, and if you pass the previous high score, it sets a new one until the game would reset, and that is, that's that. And here's our video. Like I said, there was wires going from almost every point of this board. The equipment is like the same for everyone. Our J 
new kit has like everything in it. Who's talking? Sorry? I said who's talking? Oh, uh, I'm kidding. Every I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, I'll speak up. Um, the Arduino kit, which we had, uh, pretty much encompasses almost everything in the um, setup, but you also need a PC to power it and give the code, and then wires just to uh, send the power in that direction. Um, so what did we learn from the project? Um, microcontrollers, whether you know it or not, are used in almost everything. So a computer uses it on like phones, remotes for your TV. Yeah, basically anything that uses any sort of command or code has some sort of microcontroller that tells it what to do. Because um, I got the same from my instructors actually, or was it maybe someone. Um, the computers are really strong, but they're also kind of stupid, and they don't know what to do without humans. So. Uh, it uses the code, and we can use this in our future jobs. Alright, I gave it a 7 out of 10 because after a while of trying to learn everything, it kind of got repetitive, and yeah, I really enjoyed the class, but it did get a little bit repetitive. I gave it a 10 because I, I don't know which, uh, I, I felt like everything was fresh, um, but uh, we got like a different thing every day, and so I gave it a 10. Uh, although my score is not up here, I would give it a 9 out of 10. I thought it was a very fun class and I learned a lot. Any questions? What's up? You can't see it. It's really small. The microcontroller is actually inside your controller. It's a part of it. Yeah, let's thank the... Uh,
take pull your mask off when you're speaking. So our container, uh, we did a smart container. It is a smart trash can, I guess you can call it. I am Cadet Payne. I'm Cadet Lynn. Cadet Nobulo. I'm Cadet Shedward. And I'm Cadet Gardner. Okay, so like I said, I'm Cadet McCray. I'm from Bryant High School. And my hobbies, I like to read, listen to music, sleep, and this is my whole life. You gotta say, well, this one here is the I wanna go to North Carolina AMT and become a nurse and hopefully go to the Army Reserve. Uh, hello, as you know, my name is Gennett Chubway. I come from Cleveland High School in North Carolina. Uh, my hobbies include playing video games, listening to music, and playing multiple instruments. In the future, I hope to become a, uh, well, enlisted to the Marine Corps at 17, one year away. So we're waiting until then. Uh, I'm Cadet Uh I like, I'm from Cleveland High School as well. I like to play games, I like playing outside, and I love taking naps as well. And in the future, I want to be in the military. I just don't know which grand yet, so. Uh, I'm Cadet Gardner from Wagner Sally High School, and I enjoy archery, rifle team, Wait, the <laughs> band, and then buffet. That was part of my team. Um, and then after high school, I plan on going into the military forensic science. I'm Cadet Lynn. I'm from Overhills High School, Ooh. and. Um, I enjoy singing and big bunch of movies. After high school, I want to do something in the music field and move on. So this is the outline of the stuff. This is the outline of the stuff that we're gonna. This is the outline of the stuff that we're gonna be presenting throughout the presentation. Uh, these are the concepts that we have learned well at JCLC. I mean JSLC. There are many different STEM category jobs, and uh, there's many different jobs you can go to. They branch off into di many different careers, and they all pay very well, and they all are very short-staffed. They can all use people, and it's a great way to make money in the future. Concepts we have learned about camp is about, uh, we mainly focus on IoT, Internet of Things. And so we've learned about Raspberry Pi, we've learned about ultrasonic sensors, we have also learned about um, servo motors as well, and how those work. We've also, learned, we've also learned about Python code as well as terminals and how to use it with that. We've also learned about stego, no, stego, no, good, I can't say, but you can read it. Steganography. Steganography, thank you. And many other things as well in those categories. The project objective was you're we trying to make an ultrasonic sensor where you wouldn't even have to touch it because it, sorry, we yelled a lot there. Um, it doesn't matter if you are disabled, if you are elder, or if you just have problems with that at all. Like your hands could be full, and you would just have to walk up to it, or you can even make it, or you can even make it soundproofing. So you have to talk through it, you know. So just walk up to it, and it will open up to you. Okay, this is our Python code for our ultrasonic and the servo servo motor that's on the back of the trash can that flips. Basically, this is like the distance you can be from the ultrasonic ultrasonic motor in the front of the trash can and that you know senses where you are, how far you are from it, and if you're close enough it'll open up and close back down. And then the sleep time right here is like the motor on the back, it'll open up for a couple seconds and then close so your trash is not just standing there open or it's not, you know, you're not standing there for 20 minutes trying to get it to open. So this is our system design. Our project started by connecting the server motor, which is up there, and the ultrasonic sensor to the Raspberry Pi. After we connected the motor and sensor to the Raspberry Pi, we got on our computers and used a code program called Python, which I assume you all are somewhat familiar with. Once the coding was in Python, we constructed an R container and used tape and string to assemble our automatic trash can. The tape was used to keep the motor, sensor, and string in place, and the string enabled the lid to open when the motor moved. The process of finding the right length for the string was, for us, a lot of trial and error. This is a video. This is a video of the code and the actual last run that we went to to make it. That is the ultrasonic sensor on the front of the trash can. That is the red 
cord that the wires are connected to, and that is the opening and closing. of the well at the beginning of the time when we started building our project the first thing that we started doing was we was making sure that the ultrasonic sensor as well as the servo motor was in the correct place in the board at first we thought we had a little bit of trouble getting it in the correct spots with looking at the uh, display that we had in front of us after a bit we finally got it working and then we started to make sure that the code would work with it as well once we got the Python code working correctly we then started building the project itself. We started putting the ultrasonic sensors and the servo motor on the trash can, taking it all together and making sure that the tension with the cord was not too loose, it was not too strong to open it up because at first it would, it would not open. And then it wouldn't open, it would just fly straight open. And then, as you saw in the video, it only opened a little bit because the tension was a little loose. But there's still many things that could be better, there's, you know, but it's just a prototype. So for us, for, this is the first time we've done this, we see this as a huge success in all things. Is there any questions? Go ahead. In your experience this week, would you say that Python is generally simple to learn, or would you say it's, uh, it takes a lot of time and practice to figure it out? Uh, I, for me personally, I got it down rather really quickly because it was just like, you know, don't know how to describe it. It was just like a little like DS, open desktop, you know, LSP, a few other extra stuff, it wasn't that much. It was easier for us because we were given the code. Yeah, and it is created. We had to fix a couple things in the code a couple times. So the Python and all that, it's not, I wouldn't say it's difficult to learn. I would say it does take, you know, a couple times in practice. I, um, it was pretty easy, very easy. Raspberry Pis, they will have a micro, uh, micro like it's a micro SD, uh, HDMI cord. It can, it's very small instead of like the big ones, and it's a lot smaller. It goes in the side hole about right there. Um, it can then go and plug into the computer, and it's a lot cheaper than a regular computer. This costs about $150. Laptops can cost around from $300 all the way up to $2,000. This is a very cheap and easy way to run a computer. Thank you. 
um, movement to the camera to do that direction. And the camera gave the data back to the Raspberry Redboard, which in the end gave all the data and videos back to the computer. So this is our code to move the motor itself. The code is super simple, it's Python. We use a servo application, which is in the Raspberry Pi system, which is a whole different thing. It's like Microsoft, but it's a different system for it. Um, the hardest part for this was a trial and error of how fast we wanted, how fast or slow we wanted it to turn. We didn't want it too slow, so we decided on a five second sleep time, which is how long it's at a certain angle for. And in the end, we decided for five seconds. So the term of court was the code to record. We decided on 20 seconds because it is a prototype. We didn't want to have too long of a video where it was just too much. And it was very simple. We plugged in this code right here up there. I couldn't read it. There's a lot of code going on. But we plugged that in and it automatically starts recording. And say I'm in a lecture just like you guys are. And I know my package is coming at a certain time. But I'm not really allowed to be my phone, and I can send her the code that is down here, and she can check it on it and see if it's okay. She can pick it up at my house, or she can just make sure it's okay. So this is our prototype model. In this photo here, you can see the Raspberry Pi, um, which is connected to all of the cable, um, the cables that connect to the computer. Then we have the breadboard here, which is connected to the jumper wires, which connects to the motor which you see in that um, bottom photo on the right. That, you can't really see the motor. Um, you didn't really want the motor to be shown or anything. We wanted a more polished look that also was able to hide if you wanted it on top of books or something. So, but it, the camera is still able to move back and forth without any issues. And then the top photo is us with our final project. This is our demo video. As you can see, these are two different screens. This one is for the swervo, which is the movement of the command camera. And this is all of the commands that gave the camera the okay to start recording. And there is our prototype moving. And it's moving, it is recording. Because it is a prototype, the motor is very small, so that's why you see the jittering. But if we did continue, did continue to proceed with this project, we would use a larger motor, which would stop the jitter. And what you see right now is it counting. There it stops. So this is the camera itself, what it um, has recorded and what you can see from a different computer. application, how can we use our prototype that we have designed in the real world? As we said earlier, we can access our camera's live feed from anywhere with Wi-Fi. So if you want to watch on your kids, if you have kids, or if you want to make sure your pets are okay, or if you have elderly parents and they happen to fall down, you want to make sure they're okay, or you need to call 911 for them, you can watch it from anywhere. You can also, if you have maintenance people working inside of your home and you want to just make sure that everything's running smoothly and they haven't blown up your house, you can watch it from if you're at work or if you're in school. You don't also need this for at, um, in your house though, you can also use them in school buildings where you can follow the students around and just stop when the students stop passing. And you can use it in parking lots and um, places like that area. In the top photo you see the old camera systems that you have probably seen a thousand times. These camera systems, you see two of them because the cameras do not move and they're very obvious and very noticeable. In the bottom photo, you see the brand new camera systems that are coming out. They move themselves, and they 
are very hidden areas, so if you're not looking for a camera, you're not going to see the camera, and that's what our project was based off of. So, briefly, the cybersecurity for this is the concern of keeping your password safe. As I said in the beginning, you need to have a secure password, you know, especially security, because you don't want to have a great security system, and somebody hacks in, deletes all your film, and now no one believes you about a crime that happened. Our conclusion, we, our conclusion is the project was a success. It was able to work, it was able to record it and send it to a different camera. We enjoyed it, the project. We learned a lot of the, um, information from it and we hope to do this project in the future, a project similar to this because it is our future and this is going to be what our future is based off of. Is there any questions? Good afternoon, Alpha Company! My name is Cadet Angel Barteron, and his name is... I am Cadet Acevedo from Oak Hills High. And can you hear us? Very good. 
like going on to different distances. The practical applications for this were like very various jobs that you can actually get. You can range from marketing salesmen, you can sell houses, you can, you can just have fun as a kid and fly it everywhere. You don't even have to touch it, you can just cuss play it, and it moves anywhere. Um, it, very, it has very large money outcomes, like how we did yesterday when we flew the, uh, flew the drone. We actually got it to go 400 feet up in the air, which was pretty fun. Stuff like this, you can do this for the military too. They'll pay you some good money, yeah. like not joking. And you can have very, very pretty images of your family members. Cybersecurity for IoT. Concerns about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity includes spoofing. What is spoofing? Spoofing is just when somebody like hacks your drone, takes pictures, takes your like anything personal that you had in the drone. That's spoofing. And it, they can take your privacy info. If you use your like personal information to set up an account with your drone, um, just like anything like that. You know what I mean? And that's pretty much for it. For the conclusion, we had a very fun experience. We had amazing teachers. We had very simple like, tutorials. We understood it very simple. Like, it, it took us less than minutes just to understand it. Uh, Cybersecurity could help us very, very much into science software, we can call it more, we can fly drones, actually marketing, we can just very, very lot. In my opinion, I had trouble. But I still had fun. It was like interesting to see how like things like this work. Um I don't think I'm gonna do it in the future, but it's a very cool like subject like or profession 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 yeah and thank you cybersecurity are there any questions Questions? Is that it? So All it right. Worked. What's that? Your drone worked. Yeah, wow. it perfectly. It, like it took us our kind of our second try. Kind of our second try. Because we had to do a little bit more coding to get it actually to do a full scale. Nineteen seconds to spare. So good job there. Our next group up is going to be chemistry.
this week. A lot of us had no idea what we were doing, so it was a fun experience. Um, but my job here today is to give you an overview of how we did it and what we did. So first thing first, safety. Before we did anything, we were in the classroom, we looked at videos, we talked about what to do, what to wear, and just how, you know, how to play out certain scenarios. So once we, that, once we got, had that taken care of, broke up with your battle buddies and we went up into the lab. Once we were in the lab, we each had our own little section, all of our own equipment, and we each had 11 vials. 10 of the vials, we knew exactly what were in them. The 11th one was unknown. Everyone else had to figure out exactly what that 11th one was. It matched one of the other 10. So, through a series of tests, warming it up, mixing with other chemicals, we eventually, about three to four tests for everyone, we were able to figure out what that 11th one was. And after you know, a few drawbacks, because like I said, a lot of us still knew, uh, we were able to get that one down and match it up with what it actually was. And once we found that unknown variable, we had to take its properties. So we put on a super sensitive scale. Like we had to take, you have to take the label off, otherwise it throws off all your math. So put it on a super sensitive scale, get all your numbers right, mark them down. And at the end, you know what you've done, because all the math will add up. I'll pass it off to the next one. Alright, so I'm going to go over physical properties and I that night thunder. So physical properties are properties of an element that can be observed or measured. This can include the color, the hardness, the melting point, the boiling point, or the freezing point. And next we can get Ellis. Good afternoon, Alpha. Good afternoon. I know you're all tired, but understanding understanding chemical properties is very important to what we did. So part of what we did was testing. And in understanding our testing, we had to know how one chemical reacted with the other. And that ties into chemical properties. Is each element, like he said back there, elements part of the periodic table, right? Yeah. And it's under it's very important to understand how one element interacts with the other. That's your chemical properties. You know your chemical properties is when you look at a chemical and you look at another chemical and you add them together and they react, that's a chemical property. What happens there defines what that element is and how it reacts with another element. Okay, um, I'm Dan Wilson and I'll be talking about carbohydrates. The carbohydrates were one of the things we tested on. And carbohydrates, basic sugars, everyone knows what they are, you see them on the back of your food labels. So. First one, we have uh, glucose, blood sugar. It's one of the uh, reducing sugars we tested on. Fructose, fruit sugar, obviously in fruits. Another reducing sugar. Galactose, another reducing sugar. Sucrose, table sugar. Everyone knows what that is. Lactose, milk sugar. A mix of uh, glucose and galactose, another reducing sugar. Maltose. Malt sugar, made up of grain, and it's another reason sugar. I'll be passing it off. Good afternoon, Alpha. I'm Cadet Rawl, and I'll be talking about the amino acids. So the first one that we used was cytosine. It's a non-essential amino acid, and it contains a reactive salt hydro group, or a phyllo group. We also used thyrosine, which is non-essential, and is needed to produce several brain chemicals. We also used glycine, which is also non-essential, and is used as a precursor for several body compounds. And we use methionine, which is essential and helps detoxify the body from harmful chemicals. 
Good afternoon, Alpha Company. Good afternoon. My name is Clarissa Aguilar from Thomasville High School, and I will be explaining one of the tests that we did in the lab this week. That one of those tests that we did was the Molish test. It is it is a universal test that determines the presence of carbohydrates. The positive result of there being carbohydrates in a sample is when the sample turns purple into a purple hue. Some of the uh, some of the samples that turned into a purple hue were glucose and fructose. My experience in this class was very fun and interesting, and I like that it was very hands-on. I will now be passing on to Cadet Roche. Good afternoon, Alpha Company. Good afternoon. I am Cadet Rossmeyer, and if you can't pronounce it, you just want to smoke it. I am here to tell you about the tolerance test. And so the tolerance test is a test that can perform on either amino acids or carbohydrates. And the test is meant to find aldehydes in the presence, the presence of aldehydes in different compounds of either carbohydrates or amino acids. The test, if it is positive, it will form a silver mirror on the top of the fluid, and uh, negative test it just stays clear. The silver is not a perfect mirror, it's kind of like a silver pink metallic, but you can't really see it's all perfectly in it, but it does mirror. And this test, it can be used to isolate different types of compounds. You can narrow down between the more 20 different amino acids or carbohydrates down to like 10 or 15. And you can also use this test to see if someone has a certain deficiency in using the acid carbohydrates, carbohydrates, and you can describe the other possible medicine. Um, I will now be passing this off to you. Alright. Good afternoon, Alpha Company. Good afternoon. I hope everybody's doing well. I know you just had a long day, but please stay with us. So, I will be explaining your failing test, which is a test to determine if we're reducing sugar is present in the sample. By doing this, you can boil your sample in the water about two or three minutes, and you should get a positive result of a disappearance of a blue hue and the appearance of a red hue around you, call it a precipitate. Are uh, you passing on to Logan? All right, what's up, Alpha Company? What's up? <laughs> I'm Kitae Hibisola Logan, I'm Forest Guard, because I'm going to want to get gas, so I'm going to be talking about uh, swallowing off the test. Yes, the swallowing off test. I'm going to be talking about the swallowing off test. So the swallowing off test is a test to determine either a monosaccharide, which would be a, a, a ketotose, or an octose. So does anybody know what a ketose is? Yeah. So you're going to be thinking of the keto diet, right? So ketose is like a fruit sugar, so fructose, you know? So what we do when we test, we take our test sample, you know, so we take our unknown, and then we put in the stone up reagent. That stone up reagent, we then boil our test sample with that reagent in it. And after 30 seconds, ketones should be the ones quickly heating up and turning into a red cube quickly. Our doses will also heat up as well, but they won't heat up as fast as the ketones will. And so as I said, for example, ketones will be fructose, and anything like aldose will be glucose, lactose, and galactose. I'll be passing it off to the next. Good morning, Alpha Company. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Alpha Company, stand up real fast. I see some head popping people sleeping. We wanted to pay attention. This is chemistry, right? Everyone is excited about chemistry, right? No! Yes, chemistry is fun. Stand up, stretch for a second. Make sure you're off. If you're not standing up, you're wrong. So I'll be talking about Parfum's test today. It is a test to identify monosaccharides within on the sample. So basically what you do is that you take a sample, you add Parfum's reaction in it, um, you know, some sort of liquid, then you boil it in, in hot water. After two to three minutes, you should kind of see a change, you know, change in color. If you do, then that means it is a monosaccharide. If not, then it is a disaccharide. Um, and that, if you should be able to test, it's not too much. Alright, y'all can take your seats now.
Good afternoon, Africa Media. Hear me, please. Um, so my test was a <coughs> my test was a self-containing test. Um, is a test to determine if sulfur is present in an amino acid. Uh, so basically, we had to um, we had six solutions, um, and we had to put it in um in, a, in boiling in, a boil, in boiling water. Uh, and if it was positive, it would turn into a black hue. Um, and out of all of the elements, the only one that turned into a black hue was cytosine. Um, and that's about it for my um, test. So, what does that mean? Huh? What? Cytosine. Yeah. That's the word. It's, a, it's amino acid. Oh. Good job. Hello, everybody. My name is Kate at Waterhouse, and I will be talking about the Zanthan Bell Z test. Uh, basically, what this test is, it's not the yellow compound to tyrosine. I don't know what tyrosine means. It's a chemical compound. Uh, now, if you followed all the instructions for the list of examples on the test, you will have uh, a golden yellow, a bright golden yellow when you put the test tube in the boiling water. Uh, basically, the whole purpose of this test is to find uh, greens. Uh, it's basically all chemicals forming up as a green uh, type compound. Tests with chemicals are important on a larger scale, if not worldwide. I feel like one of the most important reasons that this is true is because uh, helping, it helps scientists identify metals such as aluminum, uranium, stuff like that. Uh, also, it could be useful to identify, uh, it, it could also be used to identify moon rocks, uh, stuff like that from other planets. Uh, it's just a basic uh, student that you put on. Oh yeah, these uh, concepts are super important to like, the scientific revolution, and I feel like it's like one of the most important classes you can take. Uh, but yeah, I will pass it on to the next day. Good afternoon, Alpha Company. I'm Cadet Hunt, and I'll allow my father to introduce himself, and we'll get on through these. I'm Cadet Xavier Mueller, and I will be doing the first half of the steps for physical property experimental procedures. The first step is to measure the mass of the empty container using an analytical balance, which is just a balance to, uh, to measure things at in very small uh, weights. So you weigh that empty container, and then you're going to fill it with water. And then once you fill it with water, you're going to weigh the container that you just made for water. All right, so step five, you're going to be uh, calculating the volume of your container. After that, you're going to measure the mass of the container with your sample in it. I believe Cadet Culkin's touched on that a little bit with how precise you have to be. We talked about ripping a sticky note off. You have to be so careful with that, removing the little strips of paper that can leave, because that can actually alter your result. So after that, you're going to uh, let me see here. Weigh the unknown sample and the container together. So you're just going to add your weights together. After that, you will. So you determine the mass of the unknown sample. I won't go too much into the math. That will be covered in the next slide. After that, you will find the density of the unknown sample. That's also going to be in the next slide. Good afternoon, Alpha Company. Uh, am I good? Is this a good volume? Yeah. Oh. Cool. Um, I'm Yvette Cruz, and I'll be covering the calculations. So first off, you, after you finish uh, with your chemical test, you grab a solid sample of your unknown sample and you bring it into a separate lab and you put it onto this scale that's very, very precise. And there it gives you the weight of the empty container, the weight of water filled with the container, the container filled with water. So you fill that container, take the unknown sample out, fit it with water instead and then you just measure the volume of the container and you just you measure the the container with the unknown sample itself then you want to move on to um getting the weight of the container plus the unknown sample subtracting it by the weight of the empty container and with that you get the weight of the un the unknown sample with that you have to calculate the density of the unknown sample and you take the mass of the unknown sample and you divide it by the volume of the container and that gives you the density. I will now be followed by uh, Cadet Hayden. Good afternoon.
Good morning, Apple. Good afternoon, Apple Company. Good afternoon. I am today, Raven Waters. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of chemistry, knowledge, and all that type of stuff that they're talking about. That's over me. Please bear with me. I am kind of losing my voice, so if I'm not as loud or anything like that, please bear with me. But here I'm going to describe some of our pictures that we have. So right here, you can see two of our cadets working together to figure out what their samples are, look at the colors, they're just evaluating. And if you look right here, you see one of our teachers, Miss Lewis, and another cadet walking together as she tries to explain to him what's going on, what he should be doing, try to explain the test that they're going through. If you look right here, you see two of our cadets look at their papers, trying to figure out what test they're going to do, see the instructions of the test, and just, you know, working together. And so we have more pictures, as you see. And then you just see right here, you can see our cadets focusing in on their, on their project, trying to make sure that they're getting the right samples. And also right here, you can see our other instructor, Dr. Thomas, helping a cadet figure out how to work the um, hot plate, trying to make sure it's all good. Um, I'll say from this class, it was very learning. At first, it was kind of boring, not gonna lie. Uh, but that's what your safety videos, all that. But once we start working in the labs and working together, get more hands on, it did become more fun and interactive. So yeah, so now I'll be passed on to Cadet Farrah. Good evening, Alpha Platoon. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me well. Um, I'm going to be talking to you guys about my experience with this test here with chemistry. Uh, so first off, I'd like to start out that I've never taken chemistry before. So walking into this, I was a little skeptical as to what all I would know and how that could help me. Um, so anyhow, we'll hop right into this. We started out with um, our first test as the Mullish test. Um, and with this test, it was supposed to show whether it was an amino acid or if it was a carbohydrate, um, which if you don't know what carbohydrate is, just a sugar. Um, and so it should be able to cause it to show you what it is. So after we completed our tests, um, it had shown up that our unknown was an amino acid because it did not turn like it was supposed to for a carbohydrate. So after this, we continued on to the next test, uh, which would be an amino acid test, which is sulfur containing. Um, with this test, we had discovered um, that they kind of contradicted the first test, which had us a little curious as to what was going on. We eventually later found out that our first test was not done properly, which shows how precise you must be with all these tests where they won't work and you'll get a bad outcome. So after working through and troubleshooting, we got back into the Mullish test and redid it, found out that our chemical was very likely a carbohydrate. So we continued on with the next carbohydrate tests. Um, after that, we got to the Fellings test, which in the end of it, cut it down to four possible carbohydrates. Uh, which really cut us down because we weren't so sure how far we were going to make it. We'd already done three total tests up until this point. We still had a whole bunch of uh, elements and chemicals that it could be. So we, um, you know, we worked towards it, got to the end of it, and once we saw that, we looked at the next test that could really help us out and cut down the numbers, um, and this was the Barfoot's test. Um, once we completed this test, it got us down to two remaining chemicals, which we were able to decide that that was the maltose as our unknown chemical. And after that, we went to the next lab, um, a very special lab, where we got to check out the physical properties of our unknown. And like they said earlier, the scale was really cool to mess around with. Uh, it was very sensitive and it was very neat to see how sensitive it really was. I mean, a piece of paper could change how much it weighed. So um, after that, you know, we just kind of saw it, looked at it, made up this presentation, and uh, here we are. So thank you again for your time out the company. Um, I'll give the rest to you today. Uh, I'll be passing it on to you to that bell. 
Good morning, Alpha Company. Yes. Wait, good afternoon, Alpha Company. My good name is afternoon. My name is Avery Belton. I am here to tell you my results slash the good of the uh, presentation. Uh, my partner and I had the unknown sample of number seven. We started off with the mileage test and it was you have to be really precise. We started off with the mileage test and we we started off with the mileage test and it changed all of our carbohydrates to purple and our sample was did not change. So that concluded that all our sample was not a carbohydrate, it was an amino acid. Then we went on to the uh, amino acid test. We started with the sulfur containing test and it changed one of them to, side, um, to a black cube. So that meant our one of the cytosine was um, eliminated. Then we went to the Zan test and um, then, and we had to do it multiple times over to try to get the correct thing. We finally got it correct and our our sample changed to change. And we concluded that our sample was glycine. I will be sending it to the next person. Do you guys have any questions, comments, or anything? I was actually going to add a little bit on the end there um, and talk about the real world applications. So I saw some hands go up, and some of y'all have taken chemistry, right? Whoa. So what could you see being some real world applications of these tests, of chemistry, of this STEM course? Medicine. Medicine. Right, developing cures to cancer, like what talk, Dr. Thomas does, our instructor. Let's give a round of applause for her. Real quick. <laughs> what else? What else could possibly be something? Agriculture. Agriculture, like what? What part of agriculture? Like, like developing pesticides. Yeah. Like developing chemicals to yeah. enhance our production. Yeah. To make sure that we can grow enough food to support our growing populations. What else do we have? Weapons. All right, that's a good one. I mean, we all, we all, most of us here want to join the military. We want to be supported by the best engineering and technology, and part of that is ensuring that we have chemicals that can that can boost our military. With all things like plastics that can support our troops. What else? Nobody else. You. Hmm? Science. 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 That's a really good one. Anyone else? Food companies. Food companies. Developing sweeteners, stuff like that. Water filtration. Water filtration. We all remember being at the treatment plant. Right? Chemistry is a major part of what goes on there, ensuring that we have clean drinking water to support our cities and towns. Anyone else? That is true. They use bugs, yeah. But at other treatment plants, they use things like chlorine and such to filter the water. Hey, hey. If you're not answering, asking the question, or asking the question, please keep talking down. All right. So, do you, any of you guys have any questions or anything? Yes. So, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, physical and chemical properties. Could you uh, give a few more examples on what those would be? <laughs> All right, so with your physical properties, they're gonna be things that you can change about a substance that won't actually change the substance. Like, well, I got a good example. Like this piece of paper, physical property. Is it still a piece of paper? Yeah. Yes. All right, if I take my pencil and I color on it, is it still a piece of paper? Yeah. Yes. Well, that's a physical change. It, it's still paper, right? If I take this and I dissolve it in sulfuric acid, 
Is it still paper? No. No, no you can't put it back. Yeah, there's no way I can take this dissolved piece of paper and turn it back into paper. And so that, those are some of the ways that physical properties and chemical properties differ. Did that answer your question? Thank you. 